This is from Donald Duck, uh, my novel, D-U-K, by the way. Uh, Donald Duck is an 11-year-old boy turning 12. 12, he's completing his first trip around the lunar zodiac, his first life cycle. To help him celebrate his birthday, his father has uh, brought in his friend, an opera master with his opera company. Uh, Donald Duck does not like being Chinese. Also, he's being, uh, it is Chinese New Year's, and he's being assailed by dreams, dreams of the railroad, uh, dreams of uh, the Chinese building the railroad. And he comes face to face with the fact that uh, the famous photograph of the uh, meeting of the rails at Promontory Point, where the two engines uh, are cow catcher to cow catcher. In that picture, there is not one, not one Chinese. Who would believe anyone named Donald Duck dances like Fred Astaire? Donald Duck does not like his name. Donald Duck never liked his name. He hates his name. He is not a duck. He is not a cartoon character. He does not go home to sleep in Disneyland every night. The kids that laugh at him are very smart. Everyone at his private school is smart. Donald Duck is smart. He is a gifted one, they say. No one in school knows he takes tap dance lessons from a man who calls himself the Chinese Fred Astaire. Mom talks dad into paying for the lessons in tap shoes. Fred Astaire. Everybody, everywhere likes Fred Astaire in the old black and white movies. Late at night on TV, even Dad smiles when Fred Astaire dances. Mom hums along. Donald Duck wants to live in the late, live the late night life in an old black and white movie and talk with his feet like Fred Astaire and smile Fred Astaire's sweet lemonade smile. The music teacher and English teacher in school go dreamy-eyed when they talk about seeing Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers on the late night TV. Remember when he danced with Barbara Stanwyck? What was the name of that movie? Barbara Stanwyck? Did you see the one where he dances with Rita Hayworth? Ooh, Rita Hayworth. Donald Duck enjoys the books he reads in school. The math is a curious game. He is not the only Chinese in the private school, but he is the only Donald Duck. <clears throat> he avoids the other Chinese here, and the Chinese seem to avoid him. This school is a place where the Chinese are comfortable hating Chinese. Only the Chinese are stupid enough to give a kid a stupid name like Donald Duck, Donald Duck says to himself. And if the Chinese were that smart, why didn't they invent tap dancing? <laughs> Donald Duck's father's name is King, King Duck. <laughs> Donald hates his father's name. He hates being introduced with his father. This is King Duck and his son, Donald Duck. <laughs> Mom's name is Daisy. That's Daisy Duck and her son, Donald. Venus Duck and Penny Duck are Donald's older sisters. The girls are twins and a couple of years older than Donald. His own name is driving him crazy. Looking Chinese is driving him crazy. All his teachers are making a big deal about Chinese stuff in their classes because of Chinese New Year's coming on soon. The teacher of California history is so happy to be reading about the Chinese. The man I studied history under at Berkeley authored this book. He was a spellbinding lecturer, the teacher throbs, then reads, the Chinese in America were made passive and non-assertive by centuries of Confucianist thought and Zen mysticism. They were totally unprepared for the violently individualistic and democratic Americans. From their first step on American soil to the middle of the 20th century, the timid, introverted Chinese have been helpless against relentless victimization by aggressive, highly competitive Americans. <laughs> One of the Confucianist concepts that lends the Chinese vulnerable to the assertive ways of the West is the mandate of heaven. As the European kings of old ruled by divine right, so the emperors of China ruled by the mandate of heaven. The teacher takes a breath and looks over his spellbound class. Donald wants to barf pink and green stuff all over the teacher's book. What's he saying, Donald Duck's pal Arnold Azalea asks in a whisper. Same thing as everybody. Chinese are artsy, cutesy, and chicken dick, Donald whispers back. Oh no, here comes Chinese New Year's again. Once again, it is Donald Duck's worst time of year. 
Here come the stupid questions about the funny things Chinese believe in, the funny things Chinese do, the funny things Chinese eat, and where can I buy some Chinese firecrackers? <laughs> well, King Duck, Donald's father, is getting fed up with his son's behavior around Chinese New Year's, and he threatens his son that uh, if his son doesn't straighten up and begin behaving, uh, he's going to take him to the Chinatown herbalist and uh, get him some herbs to clean him out. <laughs> uh, which in the old days was not a very fun activity, but uh, right. a large glass bottle holds a huge ginseng root about the size of a cabbage patch doll, shaped like a man. A little blob of root is his head. He has arms and a bulbous body, legs and a little penis with hair-like roots dangling around it. The ginseng is ginger yellow with a pink blush at the joints between the bulbs and floats in a jar of alcohol. On top of the bottle's flat stopper is a fine-looking little porcelain statue of Guan Gong on horseback with his weapon. The insides of the shop look dark. The bits of faces and hands and backs of heads Donald Duck sees seem emerging from very wet mud. The insides look like a painting of something old. The herbalist is not from the funny papers. He does not wear a skull cap and bedroom slippers. The herbalist does not even look old or wear wireframe glasses. He works behind the counter in his red Disneyland t-shirt. Behind him is a wall of wooden drawers, each drawer a little smaller than a letter-sized file cabinet drawer. Each drawer holds a different dried flower, leaf, seed, stem, bark, root, tuber, or berry of a medicinal plant. Scales, choppers, grinders of ivory, brass, steel, and stone, and a pile of prescriptions being filled around the counter. He piles the ingredients of each prescription on the center of a clean square of butcher paper. The Chinatown fiddler, Donald Duck hears late at night, sits in the herb shop window. Four or five old men are stringing their musical instruments around the shop. Donald Duck steps into the shop with his father, King Duck. He can't take his eyes off the Chinatown fiddler, looking over the herbs and dried, variously preserved medicinal animals and animal parts displayed in the window around the big ginseng plant in a jar. The fiddler strings and tunes his double-stringed fiddle. His eyes move from seahorse to antler horn, one object to another, as if they are parts of a puzzle, as if they can combine to have a single meaning, a plot, a hidden message with a knowledgeable eye. He calls to the herbalist, Oi, a chakna, the seahorse, good for sexy. Old garlic fart like you better not even talk about seahorse without first being sure you have a woman. You don't want to waste the seahorse. Old men and dad break out laughing. You listen to me now, the old fiddler says. And the men laugh harder. Through a doorway, there's a back room, more than one back room. Two old Chinese in old suits and ties play Chinese chess with their hats on at a wooden table painted in green enamel. They don't laugh. The herb doctor has a shaved head. He wears a skull cap. He looks like something from the funny papers. All this stuff, deer antler, uh, dried seal gonads, uh, everything in the window is good for sexy, sexy, huh? What if I took uh, just a little bit of everything in the window and a little bowl of tea, the Chinatown fiddler asks. The thrill of all of that animal power going bang on your body will kill you 30 seconds after your first swallow, the herb doctor says. The herb doctor wears a sweater that buttons in the front. His back office is carpeted. Over the carpet are Chinese rugs. There is a couch, easy chairs. He sits behind a large rosewood desk. He motions Dad into the easy chair at the front of the desk. Tea, the herb doctor says. A little silver needles, on jam. Can't get it in the restaurants in this city. Eh, you look to be healthy and prospering. I hear good things about you. I see no fever about you, no ice in your eye, no winds howling in your bones, your lungs are clear, your breath doesn't come out cold, so you're fit to fight a crazed ox, little brother. I know you're not here for your health, then. It's my son. Ah, certainly. Come sit here, boy. The herb doctor waves Donald Duck to sit in another easy chair at the front of the desk. Donald Duck sees no doctor's tools, no shiny stainless steel instruments on the herb doctor's desk and sits. Here, the herb doctor says, put your wrist on this pillow here, boy. He guides Donald Duck's hand to laying back down palm up on a little velvet pillow. The herb doctor stands and washes his hands at a little sink in a little bathroom off of his office. How old are you? Eleven. I'll be twelve. Skinny for eleven. What's the matter, boy? Don't your uh, parents feed you at home? The herb doctor laughs and lays his fingertips on Donald's exposed pulses and reads the pulse. Hmm. What seems to be the problem, a king? So, I feel fine, Donald Duck says. He's acting strange, Dad says. He's jumpy. 
jittery, tapping his toes, clicking his heels all the time like someone with a palsy. Hmm, the herb doctor says, your other hand, please, boy. And he steals from me and lies and treats Chinese like dirt. I do not. I think I may have accidentally taken home a white boy from the hospital and raised him as my own son. My real son is somewhere unhappy in a huge mansion of some old-time San Francisco money. Stick you off your tongue, the herb doctor says. Donald Duck sticks his tongue out. The herb doctor plays a flashlight on it and reads Donald Duck's tongue. Can't believe I raised a 12 years old, a little white racist. <sighs> Doesn't even think Chinatown is America. I'll tell you one thing, young fella. Chinatown is America. Only in America can you run to any phone book, any town, look under C and L and W and find somebody to help you. Dad says, Donald Duck doesn't laugh. Doesn't understand a Chinatown joke either, Dad says. Now stick out your tongue and lift it up as far as you can. More, more, lift, lift, lift it up. The doctor, herb doctor coaxes and growls as he plays a beam of a pocket flashlight over Donald Duck's tongue and reads it. Mmm, hola, good. The doctor says and snaps the flashlight off and pockets it. Good. Herb doctor says again, smiling. He pours Donald Duck a cup of tea from a silver thermos on his desk, then shoves a dish of yellow raisins across his desk to Donald Duck. These will freshen your mouth, he says. It's no fun sticking your tongue out like that at me, I know, and your tongue gets dry. He glances at Dad as he speaks. Thank the herb doctor, Dad says, low and slow and too friendly. Thank you, Donald Duck says. His tongue feels like a dry sponge stuffed in his mouth. He sips the tea and pops a couple of raisins in his mouth. His tongue is no longer Death Valley and feels like a tongue again. The herb doctor looks through his notebooks and makes notes. He looks from one notebook to the other, to his new notes, and lowers his glasses to go eye to eye with Donald Duck. Do you have a girlfriend? He asks. No. Hmm. The herb doctor looks up from his notes again. Uh, do you think about girls a lot? No. Mm -hmm. The herb doctor looks at his notes. Uh, do you think about boys the way boys think about girls? No. Whew, Dad says. Hmm, the herb doctor says, and opens another notebook and glances from one notebook to another, then writes in his notebook. You're not going to tell me this is just puberty, are you, Dad says? Oh, no, no, this is more serious than that, the herb doctor says. Well, cousin, what is it? I would say this boy has a bad case of gotta dance. Gotta dance, the Chinatown fiddler shouts in the front room of the shop and his monkey squeaks. The other old man hem, gotta dance. What's that? Gotta dance. Can't be cured with herbs, the herb doctor says. Gotta dance, Donald Duck says, and sings and strikes a Fred Astaire pose singing a Gene Kelly song. Gotta dance, gotta dance, gotta dance. Donald, uh, the old men in the front room sing, Donald Duck dances out of the shop into a crowd, and Fred Astaire falls in step with Donald Duck. Who do they think they are? I'm smarter than any of them, Donald Duck says. You sure are, Fred Astaire agrees with a smile. I'm smarter than all of them put together. No argument there, Fred Astaire says. Well, I am. You don't have to convince me. What do they know, compared to you? Yes, compared to me, what do they know? Oh, compared to you, well, they know nothing. I know calculus. Physics, oh, that's a lot to know right there. Quite a lot indeed, very good. They don't, even know how to, they don't even know how to adjust the color on the TV. Shocking. They make everybody on the TV look Chinese. Don't they know this is America? Who could forget that? Oh, you don't know these people like I do. Not only have I been living with them, I have been reading up on them. You know why, how come after all these years they've been here, they're not more American, Donald Duck asks. More American? Yeah, American, like you and me, the kind of people who make American history, the kind of people actors play in American movies. Oh, yes, those kinds of people. Well, you know why the Chinese can't be that kind of people? Why? Passivity. Oh, that. Not only that, they're not competitive, can't stand the pressure. No. They lost a track laying contest when they were building the railroad just because they were too chicken to work in the rain. Oh, didn't I read someplace that a locomotive derailed back at the terminal? That too, but it was the rain. Oh, how slippery of them. They can't do anything right here. It's a wonder they manage it all. I'm not like them. Oh, no, Fred Astaire says. That's obvious. I'm like you. You know what I'm talking about. We speak the same language. We talk the same lingo. We dig the same jive. Oh, sure we do. I'm better than that old broken-down Chinese Fred Astaire. I have real music. 
I have rhythm and music. I could be the Chinese Fred Astaire right now if I wanted to. Oh, easily, easily. When I said I could be the Chinese Fred Astaire right now, I, I didn't mean I was really better than you. Oh, go ahead. Say it if you mean it. Don't be shy, Fred Astaire says. The words writing a happy crooning chant for, oh my, a goodly number of years now. Kids your age, a few kids your age. No, they can dance Fred Astaire better than Fred Astaire. I'm flattered. And ask any of them. I'm always happy to do anything I can to help. You do want to dance Fred Astaire better than Fred Astaire, don't you? No, just better than that pitifully poor imitation who calls himself the Chinese Fred Astaire, that's all. That's all you want? Fred Astaire looks bewildered. He puts his left hand in his trouser pocket and scratches behind his right ear with his right hand as if about to burst into dance. Cold, jello air, the far mountains, the clumps of odd bushy plants popping out of the desert at strange angles. Everything in the cold is like canned fruit cocktail in a blue gelatin dessert. A pale rumor of light outlines the dark of the far mountains from the dark of the night. The moon broods large on the horizon and, and is fiery red like a bite of raw meat glowing through the dust of a recent volcano eruption. The flames of the wood fires burn in the fireplaces and stoves of the dim sum people ready to start serving. The frog twins wearing all the 19th century clothing, clothing they own still look the same and fuss over a bun concession. Guan, the foreman, sees first light over the far mountains and finishes his tea in one more swallow. He puts his teacup down and has every eye in the dim sum people's camp on him. He puts a good-sized dark cigar in his mouth, lights it with an ember from a dim sum fire, and walks across the dim sum camp to the edge of the railroad camp. A string of 10,000 firecrackers hangs from a rope attached to a pole. Boys and girls from the dim sum camp hold the rope and poles a boy with a gong and mallet waits by the string. Guan lights the fuse to the string of firecrackers with his cigar. The firecrackers begin cracking, one and two at a time, and then rat-a-tat-tat, then a roar of continuous overlapping explosions. The boy with the gong beats chunga 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 on the gong through the railroad camp. Wake up! Wake up! Today is the day! Ten miles, ten hours! Donald Duck wakes up in a tent with other boys, waking up to the gusting and gushing firecrackers, cracking and the smell of gunpowder blowing down the line of tents. First light, time to eat and tea before dawn. Donald Duck wears a flat-brimmed black hat, a blue denim shirt with a Chinese collar, cuffed sleeves, a black, black denim jeans held up with a black leather belt two inches wide, black boots. He buys a bun from the Frog Twins, who give him an extra one for free. He munches his buns and wanders through the crowd of workers, working themselves up to go to work. He comes to Dung the wrestler's Gung Fu family, family's camp. Where is Dung now? Still costumed as Guan Kung? The girl around Donald Duck's age works out with a spear next to the family's medicine wagon. Small children and the very old of the dim sum people's camp watch her and mutter to each other with smiles on their faces. The back of the wagon opens up. A wheelbarrow-like cart to carry a drum rolls out backwards behind Dung. On the cart is what looks like a big whiskey barrel with some of the top and some of the bottom cut off and covered with a buffalo hide to make a big loud drum. A young man takes up pulling the drum cart. Dung the wrestler beats the rhythm on the hide and then on the edge of the drum head on the steel rivets holding the skin to the sides. Four other men carry a dancing lion. Its movable ears flop up and down. Its movable eyes bounce partially closed and open. The movable lower jaw wobbles. The white beard sways. Even unmanned, it looks alive, drugged, but alive. One carries the head, one carries the tail, and two carry staves. Come on, boy. Today we make history, Dung the wrestler calls. Dung and his Kung Fu family wheelbarrow their big drum and march to the railhead, carrying their gongs and cymbals and the bamboo and paper mache lion head. Dung the wrestler beats the drum, the family beats the brass. Chinese work along the way, workers along the way meet the tool wagon. Some take bars and hammers off the moving wagons and walk on. Others climb onto the wagons and ride to the end of track. The steel-tired wheeled, the steel-tired wooden wheeled wagons stop along the gravel right away where the work will begin. Horse-drawn wagons loaded with cross ties are ready, ready to roll. In the chief engineer's tent, artists and reporters from the newspapers and magazines sit in, sit in camp chairs provided by the railroad and sketch by chief engineer and superintendent J.H. Strobridge's lamplight. Strobridge is a tall, black-bearded man with one sad eye of a spaniel and an eye patch. Along the line of tents and pavilions, Charles Crocker rides his white horse, wearing his white hat, his white outfit, and sporting his sidearm and riding crop. Quan, the foreman, stands at the head end, facing his gangs, waiting for the start. He bellows each word, one hole at a time. 
His voice carries and echoes in the murky light before dawn. One day, the Irish lay four miles of track between sunrise and sunset. Four miles, world record. We lay six miles, world record. Donald Duck sees the politicians and railroad barons at the windows of their custom-built parlor cars straining to hear Quan the foreman and laughs. They don't understand Cantonese. Donald Duck understands every word Guan the foreman says. One day, the Irish say, we make 10 miles in one day. They get up, start work at 3 in the morning, dark. They work by lamplight. They work till midnight, 21 hours. How many miles? 10 miles? Did they lay 10 miles of track? No. 9 miles? No. 8 miles? No. They lay 7 miles. 1,800 feet, seven miles, 1,800 feet, and 21 hours is a joke. We make five miles in 10 hours without working hard. We will not work 21 hours or 18 hours and call it a day's work. We start work at sunrise. We stop work at sunset. 10 miles, 10 hours, 10 miles, one day's work. The gangs cheer. They shout 10 miles, 10 hours, one day's work. 10 hours, 10 miles, one day's work. A white missionary in a clerical collar and white buckskin jacket swaying long black fringe translates for Strowbridge and the artists and writers under the awning of Strowbridge's tent. He strains to hear the shouts precisely through the drips and dribblings of old rain and dew warming in the cold light. 10 hours, 10 miles, one day's work. That is one arrogant fellow that what's his name, Chinese, a writer quips. And afterwards, Guan is his name. Guan the foreman, Strobridge says. A Chinese foreman? All the foremen are Chinese gentlemen. Up in the Sierra Nevadas, we not only encountered solid granite mountains, we had no choice other than blasting tunnels through with nitroglycerin, an impossibly temperamental new explosive, no one but the Chinese dared play with. And one terrible winter in the high mountains, followed by a worse winter in the higher mountains. And when you are once again comfortable in your work, confident the worst is over and the Chinamen are civilized, they go on strike. They would not work without back, their back pay being paid up and Chinese foremen for Chinese gangs. The wisest thing the railroad ever did was to agree to the Chinamen's demands. For no sooner did they have their pay due them in their hands than they asked for an increase in their pay. The railroad refused with trepidation, I might add. But the Chinamen had made a deal and they kept it though they knew it was short of what they might have gotten had they asked first. Guan the foreman watches and sees dawn crack over the mountains and lights the fuse to a rocket. The gangs on the ground watch the rocket trail sparks and explode. Drivers whip up their horses, lumpers hang on, wagons roll out. The head end gang tamps the riprap roadbed around the cross ties. Eight Irishmen grab 30 foot lengths of steel rail off the head end flat car and 16 Chinese nab it with tongs and trot it pass the doubled locomotives to its place and trot back. The rails are grunted and nudged and gauged and lined by one gang chanting commands and calls that become a song. Another gang bolts the fish plates together and watches the nuts and bolts and wrenches the nut, nuts and bolts tight to hold one rail end to end with another for the continuous steel ribbon shining across the desert. Cross ties, tampers, gaugers, and pushers, spikers, nuts, and bolts. Thank you.